From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. A federal judge in Texas vacates President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan, but will that hold up on appeal? Plus, the latest inflation report shows prices up 7.7% year over year. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnist Alicia Finley and editorial board member Mene Ukwebrua. Welcome and happy, exciting end of the week Friday to you both. The order yesterday on Thursday from Judge Mark Pittman of the District Court in Northern Texas puts President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan on hold for now. The bottom line conclusion is that the 2003 HEROES Act does not give President Biden authority to unilaterally cancel hundreds of billions of dollars in student debt. And I'll read a couple lines from the ruling. No one can plausibly deny that it is either one of the largest delegations of legislative power to the executive branch or one of the largest exercises of legislative power without congressional authority in the history of the United States. In this country, we are not ruled by an all-powerful executive with a pen and a phone. Instead, we are ruled by a constitution that provides for three distinct and independent branches of government, unquote. That, again, was Judge Mark Pittman. But, Alicia, these are really unusual rulings in that we already know the conclusion at the end. All of the interesting parts in these student loan cases are about the standing. Usually that's the kind of thing that if you're reading a federal court ruling, you can kind of skim over. You're assuming that the people who have brought the case, gotten it to a ruling by a judge, have standing, have the ability to sue, they have an injury that the court thinks is addressable through a ruling. And here it's the billion-dollar question in these student loan cases. And Alicia, I'm not sure that the judge is going to convince his colleagues on the appellate court there. So on one point, I just want to say that, yes, we all kind of realize that this is unconstitutional or that this violates the separation of powers. And we kind of take that for granted that, that this is going to be the outcome of the case. And Judge Pittman does a very good job, you know, analyzing this. But you also have to recall, you know, we all thought and believed that the Biden administration's vaccine mandate and CDC eviction moratorium were similarly unconstitutional for the same kind of separation of powers reasons. Yet it nonetheless got positive rulings in some of the lower courts. So I wouldn't take it necessarily as granted. I mean, it depends which judge they got lucky in this case, but in terms of actually landing a conservative Trump appointee who did a very nice job analyzing the structural and separation of powers issues. And as you said, the president does not have the authority under the 2003 HEROES Act. That was a post-9-11 law that allowed the administration or the education sector to modify or waive any statutory or regulatory provision in a financial aid program. And the Biden administration argued that, well, no, that the law does, that it's uh, capacious enough to allow the administration to waive the requirement to repay any loans across the board. Now, the judge here in Pittman cast doubt on, one, whether there's actual national emergencies in effect, and two, and said, regardless, you don't have clear congressional authorization. Now, let's backtrack to your second question about the legal standing issue. Under longstanding jurisprudence, plaintiff must demonstrate that they have suffered a concrete and particular injury that is fairly traceable to a defendant's conduct. In this case, the plaintiffs argue, there are the two plaintiffs in the cases, one, one was ineligible for debt forgiveness because her loans are commercially held by some kind of investor. The other was ineligible for the full $20,000 in relief because he didn't receive a Pell Grant. And they argue that because the administration didn't go through notice and comment under the Administration Procedures Act, it violated, basically, it was arbitrary and capricious, it violated the law. And therefore, because they weren't allowed to express their disagreement with the administration's plan, the plaintiff's injury, they claim, is that they did not receive loan forgiveness and therefore were denied a procedural right to comment on the program's eligibility requirements. Now, the judge ruled, uh, agreed with them, and said that they only had to prove the existence of a associated concrete interest and not a guarantee of a concrete harm due to the procedural violation. And the judge goes on to cite some Fifth Circuit cases here. Now, I think this is very debatable. They haven't suffered a concrete 
injury. But courts in the past, they have applied standing principles somewhat flexibly. The Supreme Court has as well. I wouldn't say it's guaranteed that the Fifth Circuit will overrule or will stay this judge's decision. They may be inclined to, you know, let it proceed all the way up to the Supreme Court because there are very serious issues at stake in separation of powers issues at stake. The reason why I think the judge ruled the way he is is because he wanted to give the plaintiffs the benefit of the doubt because the constitutional issues are so brave and important. So they, I think he wants to kind of kick this up to the Supreme Court. And maybe that's right. Two points that I would make jumping off of what Alicia said on the point about standing. A lot of the claims here have to do with the Administrative Procedure Act, which is the law about how a administration, a White House, bureaucratic agencies go about making new rules and regulations. And so the standing claim here is that These people who were ineligible for student loan relief or for the maximum amount of student loan relief could have made arguments that the student loan program should have been broader if the administration had gone through the normal rulemaking notice and comment that they generally do when they're passing some kind of rule or regulation. And so the judge finds on that basis that they have standing to sue. But then it's fascinating because then he gets into the merits and he says this. Because the program was issued under the HEROES Act, which exempts notice and comment, the program did not violate APA's procedural requirements. And then he goes on, Manet, to talk about the substantive problems with the HEROES Act. But if the lack of notice and comment is the basis for the standing, then I don't see how it is a problem if the HEROES Act is exempt from the notice and comment rules. And then secondly, on the point that Alicia made about the capaciousness of the administration's legal argument here. I also found this line that jumped out to me. The judge says, Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic falls within the HEROES Act's definition of an emergency, but it is unclear whether the program is necessary in connection with that national emergency. The COVID-19 pandemic was declared a national emergency almost three years ago and declared weeks before the program by the president as over. And then he also adds that the government contends that in 10 years, They could still use the HEROES Act to forgive student loan debt because of COVID-19 pandemic if the secretary deems it necessary. And Manet, again, I'm putting the standing issues aside, which are the legal barrier to some of these claims. It is not hard for me to see the real substantive separation of powers problems here in the Supreme Court and some other cases that's called the major questions doctrine. Did Congress delegate to the president, whoever the president may be, the power to just wave a magic wand and make student loan debt go away. Right. I think we can all agree that Judge Pittman does establish standing in his ruling, but he's much more cogent when he's addressing the substantive problems with the student loan forgiveness plan that the Biden administration has implemented. And he specifically cites the recent string of cases that have reevaluated Chevron deference, the ability of these executive agencies to define vast powers into any ambiguity in the mandate that they've been given by Congress and the laws that establish them. And specifically, he cites the more recent one, West Virginia versus EPA, which curtailed the powers of the EPA to pass certain regulations on emissions and such. And so essentially what he's saying is, yes, the HEROES Act does grant some hypothetical leeway to the Education Department to modify or waive certain aid provisions, but that the major questions doctrine says that there's a limit to how much they're able to define how much leeway they do have. And because student loan forgiveness concerns the elimination of billions of dollars worth of debt, there's a pretty strong precedent that suggests they need to have explicit authority before making policy determination that would grant them powers over that massive size of the American economy. It doesn't fall into what Congress intended them to be able to do when it passed the HEROES Act in 2003. And so the standing issues are going to continue to be contested. That's probably what the administration is going to be focusing on in its appeal. But on the merits, uh, once the plaintiffs are able to establish, yes, we do have a right to bring a complaint here, and there are several avenues that they can use to do that, it's very, very clear that you're going to have a final decision possibly from the Supreme Court, which says that the 
Education Department went far beyond its HEROES Act powers in forgiving this massive amount of student debt. And there are also other cases circulating. I think that's important to keep in mind. I mean, some of the headlines today are pointing out that if you go to studentaid.gov, now after this judge's ruling, it says student loan debt relief is blocked. Courts have issued orders blocking our student debt relief program. As a result, at this time, we are not accepting applications. We are seeking to overturn those orders. If you have already applied, we'll hold your application. And so that is a change. But Alicia, there was also an injunction issued by the Eighth Circuit late in October that was also blocking the administration from actually moving forward on the student debt forgiveness program. And so that was already kind of stopping things, putting the Biden plan at a standstill. And it may be that Eighth Circuit case that is really the one that will end this once and for all. So I think the Eighth Circuit case was one that was brought by states. Missouri in particular led that, but it was also uh, joined by Nebraska, Arkansas, South Carolina, and Iowa. In that case, Missouri, I think, has a very strong argument that it has standing because it actually is a federal student loan servicer. So its argument is that it will be denied revenue and also will experience administrative burdens as a result of this loan forgiveness. And Nebraska and Arkansas also make some similar arguments in that they also hold what were considered felt loans that were privately originated and are still mostly held off the federal balance sheet by investors. And Nebraska and Arkansas both hold those loans. And the argument there was that the administration's loan forgiveness would have encouraged borrowers to consolidate those loans into direct loans, which were eligible for forgiveness, and thereby denied them revenue from the felt loans. It's a kind of complicated argument, but I think it's actually in some ways much more straightforward in that there is a concrete injury. The problem there was that the administration tried to moot the case by saying that going forward, borrowers who tried to consolidate their felt loans into direct loans would no longer be eligible. I think courts generally have, including the Supreme Court, have not looked fondly when government defendants try to moot cases by using kind of strategic gambits like that. And so it even beyond, besides that, I think Missouri still has a strong case because it continues to service the loans. So that's apart from the felt loans, that it has suffered a concrete injury. Now, the Eighth Circuit is right now considering the case. It has just blocked basically the student loan forgiveness to give it time to consider the case. And I would expect a ruling on that within the next couple of weeks. And then I would also expect that to be appealed to the Supreme Court. 